starting over. Um, and then there's that scary time when all of a sudden that child may not be in the house anymore. You know, that child's moving on to college and you're not able to protect them anymore. And I'd wager, I've never had a, a pews designated of just youth, so I'm probably going to reference y'all a good bit. Uh, do y'all hear a lot of talks about that? They're like, you know, when you go to college, you've got to do these things. There's not going to be anyone to wake you up in the morning. You can sleep through things now. Uh, do y'all hear that a lot? Wow, okay. Not a lot of, not a lot of reaction. All right, I won't address them anymore. Um, so I heard a lot of that, and for good reason. You know, it's very important when you send off your young 18-year-olds to go live by themselves. You want to know that they're making the right decisions, not that you're not there to force them to. Um, however, I've realized I don't know that I hear quite as many talks about endurance centered on the older members or even the middle-aged members. Uh, but who needs endurance more? The person that just started a race or the person that's been running it for a while? You know, we understand that logically. Um, and endurance is a topic that's very important throughout the book of Hebrews. Uh, you know, he, he mentions it a lot. If, if you studied Hebrews, you'll know that at the beginning, he kind of focuses a lot on talking about how Jesus is better than, and then you can fill in the blanks. He talks about how Jesus is better than the high priests, and he's the, the greatest fulfillment of the high priest we've ever had. He talks about how he's the greatest sacrifice that we've ever had, and all sorts of these things. But then, after we kind of get through this uh, fundamental teaching about how important Jesus is, we start focusing on endurance. Uh, if you'll flip over a couple pages to chapter 10, Hebrews 10, starting in verse 32. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exp exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Isn't that really summing up everything that we do, everything we believe? Don't you want to know that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what is promised? Because you endured throughout the whole way. Um, if you were to challenge me to a race out in the parking lot, I'd say for about the first four or five steps, you might think this guy's a runner. Once we get to about step six or seven, though, you'll quickly realize he hasn't run since high school. And so that's why we need endurance, right? It's easy to fake it for just a little bit. It's easy to put on a nice suit or a nice dress on a Sunday and show up here and make the whole world think, yeah, I'm doing what I need to do. I'm not struggling. Things aren't hard. When in reality, life is hard, isn't it? Satan will pull up things in your life that struggle and make it difficult. Maybe just aging. Maybe just health. Life gets difficult. And we need endurance. I'm not going to go practice running. I have no intentions of being a good marathon runner. Why? Because it's not easy. I don't enjoy it. Unless I had some sort of big reward or big reason, I'm not going to practice that sort of thing. But boy, do we have a big reward and a big reason to practice this sort of endurance, don't we? And so, you know, it, it starts off in chapter 12 telling us why it's so important to have endurance. And we'll start reading the first 13 verses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Not be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, Lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet 
so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Thank you for sticking with me through that longer reading. Uh, the first thing I just want to point out, I, I thought it was interesting, is how he says in verse 1, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Um, I would have said, you know, beforehand, you know, obviously, if I want to endure, I've got I've to get rid of sin in my life. There's sins that are holding me back, sins that are making it hard to focus on God, focus on my earthly relationships the way that I should. Of course, if I want to endure to the end, I've got to get rid of sin. But he doesn't just say that. Also lay aside every weight. And I spent a lot of time just kind of thinking about what, you know, the difference is, why he added in that extra thing. And I think that there's things other than sin that we also need to lay aside. Uh, and I'm going to use, he talks about it again later, uh, making your path straight, just kind of talking about making it easier on yourself. And I'm going to use an extended analogy that a coach gave me one time, if you'll bear with me. Um, the coach was kind of just talking about, you know, just sort of the decisions we make. And you know when you're watching a football game and you'll see, you know, maybe the, the defense will finally hold the offense, but then there'll be a penalty flag, late hit out of bounds, new set of downs, and the whole defense is just furious at this one guy for making that penalty that just ruined the whole drive for the team. And you, you look at that player who did something that was obviously dumb and obviously illegal, and you think, how could he make that mistake? You know, what, 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 what was going through his head that made him do something that was so detrimental to his team? Uh, when we look at that guy, we, we think that, and we're shocked. But you know, that player, he knew what he did was illegal, but he still did it. Um, and what we don't realize is throughout that whole game, he hadn't done it before. You know, he hadn't made this mistake up until, you know, very late in the game. And when you realize it, he really just made one mistake that we saw. We didn't see all the other times he didn't make the mistake. And the reason that, you know, we, we kind of don't realize that is because when we think about decisions, I think a lot of the times uh, when I, you know, look at my own life, the decisions I make, I think they're so big and important. You know, I imagine the president who's got his thumb over the button deciding which country he's going to let live and destroy in our wars. Those are the way I view my own decisions. But you know what sort of decisions I make my day to day? I choose if I'm going to wear a brave shirt or an auburn shirt. I, I choose what I'm going to put on my bagel before I leave for school. You know, I, I choose if I brush my teeth before I comb my hair or do it the other way. I don't make very hard decisions during the day. And even when I look through my day, there's not a lot of hard decisions I have to make. But I have to make a bunch of them, don't I? And so he said that the best way to kind of think about the decisions we make is, is not so much like these big decisions we spend a lot of time on, but to think more about the SATs or I guess the ACTs. Is that what y'all take? Y'all prepping for that? Yeah, there we go. Y'all nodded heads. I just had to bring up something y'all hate. Um, think about, if you can, take yourself back to when you're in high school, um, and you had to take those standardized tests, all right? And, you know, the individual questions on those tests, by themselves, they're not that hard. Uh, Y'all may hate me for saying this, but if I were just to give you one question from that test, and I said, you've got all day to figure this out, I don't think you'd be too stressed. You might know the answer, but even if you didn't, you could Google it. That wouldn't be too hard. Maybe you've got someone smart you respect and say, hey, do you remember how to do algebra, you know? If I just gave you one question and you had all day to do it, you wouldn't be too worried about it. That's not what they give you, is it? No, you've got, what, three, four hundred questions that you have to answer in a couple hours? And when you do the math, it comes down to you've got about 90 seconds for each question. And they just keep coming, don't they? When you have that many questions you have to answer, and you've got such a short amount of time to think about it, and you don't have any help, are you going to get some wrong that, you know, maybe you knew the right answer to? Are you going to make some mistakes because you're pressured and because you may not be thinking right, because your brain gets tired, you've been thinking for hours straight? Or are you going to fall short of what you might do otherwise? You might get some wrong that you knew the answer to. That's what our lives are like. When I look at my own life and I look just followed myself through a day, I thought about this and I just followed myself through a day and the decisions I made. I was able to see all the times that I had slipped up, all the times when I had sinned, and they weren't these massive, giant sins that, you know, they were just small things, small things that I knew better. I would be hanging out with a group of my friends or coworkers, and, you know, there'd be something to happen, and, you know, we'd talk bad about someone that wasn't in the room. And if you were to ask me before I left the house, hey, is it, is it wrong to gossip, and is it wrong to talk bad about people and to not show the love? I'd say, of course it is. I know that it's wrong. I can take you to verses proving how wrong that is. But then throughout the day, after I've spent hours interacting with other people, 
I make mistakes. I've had all these situations and I slip up. Or maybe I tell a lie. And you know, I know that telling lies are wrong. I can take you to verses telling you lies are wrong. But then, you know, it gets to 3, 4 p.m. throughout the day. I've been making all these decisions. I get tired of making all these decisions. I take the easy way out. And I slip up about things that I know better. It's not because I don't have enough Bible knowledge that I'm making these mistakes. I just get tired. I don't endure throughout the whole day. And so, just kind of thinking about that and thinking about this verse, if I can take you back to Hebrews 12, if you had to take the, uh, the ACT or the SAT tomorrow, do you think you'd stay up till 2 a.m., you know, eating Hot Pockets and playing video games? Or would you get a good night's rest? Would you eat, you know, healthy food? Would you make sure that you were prepared, maybe even study a little bit, go over some things you couldn't remember? If I told you you had to do that, wouldn't you set yourself up for success? And yet when I look at my own life and I look at how every single day I'm faced with thousands of decisions, I'm not always setting myself up for success, am I? And so laying aside every weight, making our path straight, I think there's some things that I can do that may not necessarily be sins, but are they really making it easy on me? Uh, there's some movies that I could watch. And, you know, I can't find a verse that says don't watch movies with a lot of bad words. I can't find that verse. Um, and if you have it, then share it with me. It'll make this sermon a lot better. But you know what? There's some movies out there that have some language that they're making it harder on me to go out and make good decisions afterwards, aren't, isn't it? When I'm talking to my friends, is my brain going to be full of that conversation about the Bible I just had with my preacher? Or is my mind going to be thinking of all the things I just heard in that movie? Or you can even go to music. There's some music I could listen to. And how am I going to talk to people when what my brain was focusing on my entire drive to school that day was just horrible, filthy language? And then I'm shocked when something slips out, when I say something rude or something hateful. Do you realize I can make so many decisions that could make it so much easier on myself to make the right decisions throughout the day? What if I started off my morning on my drive and I was listening to scripture? And then later, when I'm talking to people, you know what my mind's on? What I remember? I remember the scripture I read before I left that morning. Or maybe the scripture I listened to in the car. And if you don't believe me that'll work, I want you to just think about it at your job. How often does someone come up to you and say, you want to hear what I heard on the radio this morning? Isn't that what we feel when we're trying to make conversation with people? There's a lot of things that I could do that aren't setting me up for success. And then as I go up throughout my day and I look back at my decisions and I wonder, why is it so hard to be a Christian? Why am I constantly falling short? Why am I making all these mistakes? And it's because I'll be given a temptation at 4 p.m. and I haven't thought about God since Wednesday. And I'm shocked. How did I not make the right decision? Well, it's because I've been making bad decisions leading up to it. I just didn't realize it yet. And so I want you to think about, as you go throughout your day, these small decisions that we're making, they're not really that small, are they? They're opportunities to convert people to the Lord. People that you have dozens of conversations with throughout the day and you didn't even think of bringing up God because you haven't thought about God since Sunday morning. We have these opportunities. And if you start looking at the sort of decisions you're making, if you lay aside every weight, all these things we're carrying with us, well, of course the race is hard to run. You picked up all this baggage. Make the path straight. You know, those crazy people that not only think running is fun, but they trail running. Those people are psychopaths. I don't know how they don't roll an ankle just looking at the path. They're intentionally choosing the hard way. If you have to run anyway, you want it to be on that nice circle around the football field that, you know, you hope they let you use. Make it easy on yourself. We just had a lot of New Year's resolutions come up. All right, and you know what's the big one people always choose? I'm going to lose weight this year. Imagine if your New Year's resolution is you're going to lose weight, and then you know you, you find a gym that you're going to work out at, but the gym's actually an hour away from, from your house and from work. And so you're like, okay, but I'm going, to, I'm going to lose weight this year. And also, it's kind of expensive, and you don't really like it. It's not even that good of a gym. Do you think you're going to keep going to that gym? No. You made it as hard as possible for yourself. You know, the people that stick to it, they found a gym that's maybe on their way to and from work. They can do it before or after they get off. Maybe it's really close to their house. It's real convenient. It's nice. It's clean. And then they wonder, why, is my, why couldn't I hold fast to my New Year's resolution all year? 
you made it hard on yourself. When you have to make this many decisions, make it easy on yourself. Don't be going out to bars and partying. Don't be watching filth. But when you spend your time in God's Word, it just makes things a whole lot easier, doesn't it? He then talks about, you know, as we go on down, making corrections. Um, starting in verse 7. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. He uses the analogy of fathers. Um, and it, when you receive discipline from your parents, at the time, do you enjoy it? It's miserable, isn't it? Um, I remember I have two older brothers, and uh, there's one of them that's seven years older than me, Trent. And we're really close. You know, seven is a good age where we don't fight because he would just win at everything. So I just submitted to him in all things and just followed him around and wanted to be like him. Seven's a good age gap for brothers. And I remember one day we were hanging out, and he just, you know, he just told me, he went, hey, your laugh, it's really annoying. And I was humiliated, you know. I was like, oh, I've been laughing my whole life. <laughs> and no one had ever told me, you know. No one had ever been like, hey, Nolan, your laugh's annoying. Um, you know, at the time, that really hurt. I didn't like it. I had to kind of workshop new laughs, which is difficult. I kind of, I don't even know how I began to do that. And so I changed it. But, you know, at the time, it really hurt. But you know what I appreciate is years later when I would meet people, you know, maybe I'm in a job interview, and the guy says a joke, and I laugh at it. That guy didn't think he has a weird laugh. Because I made that correction, Right? You know, when I'm meeting my girlfriend's family for the first time, do I want them to think, man, that guy's got a really weird laugh. Um, afraid to say jokes around him. I've made that correction now, right? I'm improved. And so at the time, I was humiliated. It hurt. I was angry at Trent. He probably said it in a rude way. He was a jerk at the time. Um, <laughs> but what he said was still helpful to me. And so he talks a lot here about making corrections. And if you're talking about endurance, isn't making corrections important? Um, if you're making a long car ride, you know, one of those rides, that's gonna, it's going to be hours before you get there and you're just sitting on the interstate. Are there going to be times when you're not perfectly in the middle of your lane? Um, I'm guilty of this. Whenever I'm driving and there are cows out the window, I cannot help but look at the cows. I mean, what happens, I start to slowly drift towards the cows. When I look back to the road, I'm able to make that correction. I'm not where I need to be. It's dangerous. It'll start doing that bumpy thing over on the side. Or maybe if I'm going the other direction, that's dangerous. You have to make these sort of corrections. Because as you go throughout a long car ride, you're never going to be perfectly where you need to be all the time. As we go throughout a long car ride as Christians throughout your life, you're going to have to make these corrections. You're going to have to subtly change things. When you read God's word and you realize, that's not the way I think. Why is it that the way I think doesn't match up with Scripture? And you've got to make those adjustments, don't you? And it's even more important, the people in this building helping you. Uh, have you ever wondered why it's so important to Jesus and God that you don't worship as a Christian all by yourself? Why we gather together in groups, why it was so important. Pretty much the whole New Testament is about getting groups of Christians together and showing them how they're supposed to act towards each other. The people in this room are helping you make those corrections. And you know what? I hope that they're a lot nicer than my brother was about my laugh. But even if they aren't, a lot of times what they're saying is true. And it's helpful. And it comes from a place of love. When you receive rebuke, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to say, actually, I know all of your problems. Who are you to tell me what changes I need to make because I've got a long list of issues I've had with you and I've just been waiting for an opportunity to say them. That's what we want to do. We want to protect our pride, and it hurts at the time. And you know what? Every time a brother tries to correct you, he's not going to do it perfectly because he's not Jesus. But you need to understand you've got to put down your pride, 
You've got to humble yourself because there's a lot of people in this room that want to get you to heaven. And so if you ever have an uncomfortable conversation with the people in this room, just understand it's sometimes God's trying to make a correction in your life. And he's trying to use the people that love you most to help do it. Humble yourself. Be willing to make changes because if you were perfect, well then why are you gathered here to learn more today? No one shows up to church wanting to learn if he already thinks he's perfect, do you? Those are the people that stay home, think they've heard it all. Everyone in this building recognizes you're not perfect and you need to change. And like a loving father, sometimes we've got to receive that discipline. No matter how old or how smart we are, we still need it. He then makes, you know, he switches from fatherhood and he uses an analogy I really like. Um, I, watching football, I don't know why all my analogies are sports related. Sorry if you don't like sports. I um, was watching football a couple months ago. There was a, a fumble, everyone dives, and you see after the pile, one guy gets up and you can tell there's something wrong. You know, he starts jogging over the sideline, but his right arm, he's not moving it. And what you realize as you watch him, he dislocated his shoulder. And that player with the dislocated shoulder, he's got to jog over to the sideline, and someone's got to pop it back into place. Because if he doesn't get it popped back into place, that arm is useless to him. He can't move it. It hurts too much. He essentially only has one arm until it's popped back into joint, right? We understand that. That makes sense to us. And also we understand it's probably really scary to get it popped back in. I've never been athletic enough to injure myself, but I imagine... It's really scary the moment before your shoulder gets popped back in. It looks painful. They always scream when it happens. But we have to do it, right? Likewise, if you've got sin in your life as a Christian, sin that you're constantly struggling with and constantly fighting, you're going to be useless to other Christians in this church. Where God puts you here to help each other, if you're constantly putting out your own fires, you're useless. And let me explain that by using an analogy of Samson. Uh, think about Samson in the Bible. God gives him this amazing ability so that he can protect his people. You know? And it's one of those abilities we love to talk about, the strongest man that ever lived. And it gives us his amazing list of exploits he does, how he can defeat any amount of Philistines with you know, not even using weapons, just stuff he found on the ground. And we read that and we think, what an amazing man. But you know what? For a big portion of Samson's life, he was no good to anybody. And it's because he had that problem with women. He was constantly putting out fires in his own life when God appointed him to help protect and judge over the people of Israel. Who was he to judge the people of Israel when he had all those issues in his own life? And it wasn't until his eyesight is removed that he truly saw what God wanted him to do with his life, that he had a purpose, that God had appointed him to help others. And as a Christian, if... I'm constantly struggling with my own issues. Am I helping anyone in this building? You can't. We don't want to make those changes, though, because like popping that shoulder back in, it's going to hurt. It might be embarrassing and humiliating when everyone learns what you've been struggling with, when everyone learns what you've been up to, and it can be scary. But you're not going to be useful to anybody until you do it. And you've got to hope that the people here forgive you just as well as God will. I just wanted to remind you all this morning how important the people are in this building to your salvation, how you're supposed to be helping each other and lifting each other up and working together, not judging and think there's brother so-and-so who was rude to me that one time, and oh, there's sister so-and-so who made that comment I really didn't appreciate. It's so easy for us to start thinking those things about each other when God appointed us to help each other. Uh, I'm reminded of John chapter 17. Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. Uh, it's right before, you know, all the Gethsemane stuff we know about. And he talks with his disciples and he prays to God. And pretty much the point of his prayer is, he says, I'm not going to be on this earth much longer. But I pray that your followers are there for each other. Jesus isn't in the room with us, but he appointed his followers to help each other just as Jesus would to listen to your problems and to help you when times are tough, to answer any questions you might have and help you out of a bad spot, to love you and to forgive you. So, I hope I made you all like each other a little bit more. Continuing on the reading, pretty bad at my clicker today. I'm like three slides behind. Uh, we'll start reading in verse 14. Strive for peace with everyone and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. 
See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. First, you know, and I think it's amazing how it it goes right into this, strive for peace with everyone. Um, As we just talked about disciplining each other, helping discipline other members of the church, helping each other get to God, wouldn't it be so easy for you to sit there and just start getting a list of Christians you resent? Christians that have tried to help you because maybe they just didn't do it perfectly and you can poke all sorts of holes in how they did it and I would have done it this way. But he says, have peace with everyone because we've all got the same goal. We're all trying to get to the same place. It's not the sort of race where only the fastest runner gets the reward. The reward goes to everyone who finishes. And that's why we're helping each other when we stumble. Make sure there's no root of bitterness between you and anyone in this building, any one of the Lord's assembly. Because God died for that person just like he died for you. And then he goes into a, uh, using Esau as an analogy. Going back to my SAT analogy, um, I remember after I took it in high school, Uh, They herded us all into the cafeteria. They gave us snacks. Um, I think that was their way of apologizing for what they just done to us. Um, And I remember there was that one kid, you know, that cool kid that just doesn't care about anything. And we're all talking about what we did for this question or whatnot. And he just sits there and goes, I didn't try. And we all look at him. We're shocked. We're like, we we were in there for hours. What do you mean? He's like, I just put A for all of them. They can't waste my time. Um, Which is an irony in and of itself, but we'll ignore that. he didn't realize how important that test was, right? You know, there's probably a point where he wanted to go to college, and you have to have an SAT or ACT score to get into college, and his score was whatever putting A for everything gets you, which I can't imagine is great. And you know what he probably had to do? Probably had to take it again. Um, And probably had to pay money this time because that one was free that the school gave you. The reason he didn't try was because he didn't realize it had a purpose. You know, there was a point to doing it. There was a reward that you get by put going through those grueling hours of standardized testing. And he brings up Esau, who, you know, if there's one thing to sum up the life of Esau, I think it's someone that didn't really plan ahead. When he gave up his birthright, because he didn't realize how badly he wanted it, and he didn't realize how important it was until he reached a point where he couldn't get it anymore, could he? His father was dead and gone and had no birthright to give to him, and that's when Esau realized, I've made a mistake. He couldn't undo it. His parents were dead. There was no more blessing to give him. And so the writer of Hebrews uses Esau as an example. You still have that opportunity to receive that birthright. Esau, once it was too late for him, he regretted it. But right now, each and every one of us has an opportunity to get that birthright. Don't wait until it's too late to regret that you never cared about it. Don't wait and realize you've cared more about Stu than the blessings of your father. Thank you so much for your careful attention today. Um, it was a little intimidating hearing that I'm following up Bill Hall tonight. Um, feel like it's being a minor league player, you get called up, and then you realize your first picture you're facing is Nolan Ryan. Uh, however, I realized if I did a bad job today, he should make more than make up for it tonight. I want you to think about your day, maybe just tomorrow. Maybe the decisions you make from here on the rest of the day. And realize just how many questions you're having to answer throughout the day. What can you do to prevent yourself from getting those wrong? And if tomorrow you've improved, maybe you woke up and you thought, maybe, you know, instead of turning on the news, I'll read a chapter of Scripture. And then you think about it. You don't just read it and put it away, but you think about it on your car ride. Just think about the love of God and how important it is, and then you start to realize that maybe the conversations you're having with your coworkers are a little more focused on God when before you just talked about what you saw on TV the night before. And maybe you start to realize that temptations that might have gotten you before, I'm thinking about God. You start to do better. And when you do better one day, it's a lot easier to endure, isn't it? when the days aren't so hard because you're struggling and you're trying to figure out why being a Christian is so difficult because everything you want to do is contrary to what this book says, that's when it's hard. But it's when you're focused on it. 
that it starts to get a lot easier, doesn't it? Um, I'm going to share an analogy that I heard from a preacher, Tommy Peeler. I'm sure a lot of you know the name, but it's a good analogy. And I'm only 26, so I don't have enough life experience to give my own analogies. Um, he said that one time he went on a uh, preaching trip to Russia. And I think he said it was the early 90s or the late 80s. And while he was there, he said that, you know, it's before cell phones and really their phone system was terrible. And he had been married for only a few years. Um, and he said the postal system was also terrible. And he was in Russia for a couple months. And he reached a point where he, he really just started missing his wife. And it's just really difficult to get in contact with her. They were writing letters, but they just weren't getting to each other. They couldn't call. And he finally received a letter from his wife in the mail. And he said that he just spent so much time going over it, each and every word, because he missed her so much. And he just had no other way to contact her, nothing else. But he had this letter that just talked about how much she loved him and how proud she was of him and how it wasn't going to be that much longer, but one day they'll be reunited. Isn't that what the Bible is? It's a love letter from someone that we're not currently with, but someone who's very excited to see us, trying to remind us to make the right decisions, that I know that it's hard right now, and I know it can be difficult, but it's going to be a lot better. You just got to wait, because there's something so amazing waiting for you back here with how much love and compassion there is. That's how we should read the Bible. And when we're reading that sort of a love letter each and every morning and every night, not just reading it as something to get done or something to complete in a year, but reading it realizing it's a love letter from the person or from the being that loves you more than you can even love yourself. Don't you start making better decisions? Don't you start being a Christ-centered person? If any of you haven't been Christ-centered, if you've been focused on the passions and the desires of this world, and if maybe you need some discipline this morning, you need the brethren here to know what's been going on so that they can gather together, that they can love you and they can forgive you and they can make everything better. Or maybe you've never entered into the love of Christ through baptism and gained his salvation.